So this is the second lecture on the fourth century. And what I'd like to do is talk about a early uh, Christian religious movement uh, called Arianism. And Arianism really is all about Christology or, or the nature of Christ and how people viewed um, who Christ was and his relationship to God. So we've got a number of ancient sources that can tell us quite a bit about um, early this early Arian movement. Um, one, of course, we've talked about before is Eusebius of Caesarea in his ecclesiastical history. You have Athanasius, and we've talked about him before. He was uh, the bishop of Alexandria and really hated the whole Arian movement. You have a man named Rufinus of Aquila. Uh, he wrote a book called Ecclesiastical History. You have a man named Socrates who wrote uh, his own book called Ecclesial Ecclesiastical History, Philostorgius. Um, he was something called like a semi-Arian, so he was really Arian. Uh, also another book called Ecclesiastical History, and then you've got the Theodoret and Zosimin. So we've got quite a few sources that can tell us about what was happening during this time point. Um, let me give you just a little background about these, uh, these characters. So you've got um, a man named Arius, and he's the one who the whole movement is named after. As you can see from this uh, slide, he was a priest and he became a priest in 311. Now, a man named Alexander became bishop in, uh, or uh, was a bishop until 328, and he and Arius did not get along, primarily because of the beliefs that Arius had. So you start to see some of these problems showing up in probably 318 or 319, we don't know the exact um, date. And part of the problem is that Arius would go around to his various churches, and remember he's just a priest, and he believed that God came first. And at this particular time point, there was no Christ and there was no Holy Spirit. It was only God. Um, Alexander, however, believed that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, which we're not going to really talk about too much, all existed at the same time. So Arius went around uh, preaching different views than his bishop, and it wasn't very popular uh, for Alexander. Now, Arius and the whole Arian movement, there's a lot of debate about exactly what uh, they believe. But in general, um, Arius believed that God alone was in existence for all time and was uncreated. And at some point, God created Jesus. Um, so what this really means is that, and we'll talk about this word in just a little bit, homoousius, um, it literally means of the same nature. So for Arius, he doesn't believe or didn't believe that God and Jesus were of the same nature or of the same substance. So he does believe, though, that Christ existed before the creation of the world and that it was Christ and God who actually created the world. However, one of their catchphrases uh, was there was a time when the sun was not, meaning um, God was alone in his existence and then created Jesus and then both of them together created uh, the earth. But what's happening here is that Arius is trying to preserve monotheism, or the belief that there's one God, and this is one way that he did it. Now, of course, we've talked about this before. Lots of people use the Bible to back up their beliefs, and Arius was no different. Uh, one of his favorite, favorite scriptures to use was Proverbs 8.22. The Lord created me at the beginning of his ways, and here me is Sophia, or wisdom. And so Arius pointed to this proverb and said, this shows that Jesus was created. So he created um, Jesus at the beginning of his ways. And then he also used um, Romans 11:36 and John 16:28 uh, to back up these ideas. And of course, this is what he's teaching people. So Romans 11:36, 36, uh, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And him here is God, not Jesus. So this is something that's showing that God is at the top of the hierarchy and then Jesus is below. And then he uses John 16, 28. I came from the Father and, and I've come into the world. So he, if he came from the Father, it means the Father came first. So that's according to Arius. And lots of people um, believed the views of Arius. So now when he started clashing with his, with his bishop um, and when this... Um, when these two started spreading their ideas um, beyond Egypt, uh, there were lots of problems. So you can see here, I've given you a list of things. Um, it, this led to open riots. 
in a number of big cities. Um, you find various churches being burned to the ground, either the, the churches that sided with um, Alexander or the churches that sided with Arius. Um, you've got church buildings um, trading sides. So what that means is um, one day a church could support Alexander and the next day it could support Arius. And you also have lots of bishops changing sides, some changing multiple times. Um, part of the reason why this, this idea of Arianism spread is because Arius was a really good speaker. And I've given you here a few um, primary texts. So what you should do is stop the video and take a look at these. Um, you've got a man named Theodoret, who talks about how Arius went around door to door, um, meeting with people, conducting private meetings and so on. Uh, Philostorgius, again, he's the Arian um, history writer, says that Arius actually composed little songs or ditties that would help people remember um, his beliefs. Unfortunately, we don't have those. And then he also wrote a book, at least one book called the Thalia or the Banquet. Now, Alexander, of course, didn't like this. So Alexander also could point to various scriptures to back up his own belief. And remember, his belief is that God and Jesus were always in existence. So he would point to John 14, 1, I am, the fa I am in the Father and the Father in me. And then John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. So for Alexander, this is what he believed. Christ and God were exactly the same. Now, he ha held a church council in Egypt, and the result was that Arius was excommunicated, meaning he was kicked out of the church. Now, Arius didn't take this lightly, so what he ended up doing is writing uh, some letters. So he wrote letters to a number of influential bishops. One was a man named Eusebius, who is the bishop of Caesarea. Now, unfortunately, there's two Eusebiuses here. Um, there's also another Eusebius, who is a bishop of Nicomedia. And I will try and keep these uh, separate. I'll call one uh, Eusebius of Caesarea and the other Eusebius of Nicomedia, because both of them play an important part. Um, I will mention that when he wrote to Eusebius of Nicomedia, Nicomedia was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. So Eusebius of Nicomedia had lots of influence. Um, Arius also went to see Eusebius of Nicomedia. And after this meeting, the, this particular Eusebius started writing his own letters. So um, here's one of his letters, and you can find this in um, Theodoret's Ecclesiastical History, um, chapter 1.5. And so what Eusebius and Nicomedia has to say is that we've never heard of these two unbegotten beings, meaning, meaning God and Christ, nor that one has been divided into two, and so on. So Eusebius of Nicomedia totally agrees with the Arian viewpoint that God came first and then Jesus came after. Now, of course, Alexander writes his own letter, uh, letters, I should say. One of the um, more important ones for our purposes is called the Catholic Letter. So this is written in 320, and um, why don't you stop the video and then just read through uh, this particular letter. Okay, so what you can see here is that Alexander is saying there's people who have risen up, they're lawless and anti-Christian, um, teaching apostasy um, or teaching the wrong, uh, the wrong beliefs. Now you can find this letter in um, the work of Socrates Scholasticus in his Ecclesiastical History uh, 1.6. Um, Alexander also complains about another of his, another bishop. This is these, uh, Eusebius of Nicomedia. And what he does is he asks other bishops not to deal with Eusebius because he was a heretic. Um, here's just a little more of um, Alexander's Catholic letter. And here, what he does here is he gives more of the New Testament to back up his idea. Um, one in particular was John 1, 1 through 3, and it says, in the beginning was the word. So what that says for Alexander is that in the beginning, Jesus was, and he was the same uh, at the same time as, as God. Um, Arius also writes to Alexander, and it's a really interesting letter. Um, you can find this in a work of Athanasius called On the Synods, um, chapter 1, verse 16, or uh, chapter 16, subchapter 16, where he says, um, in fact, why don't you stop the video and then read, uh, read through all this. So what he's really seeing, saying here is that the Father was always in existence and then the Son comes after. And again, what he's trying to do here is to preserve monotheism or the idea that there's one, one God. 
Um, now what you're going to see through this, um, uh, the rest of this is that there were a series of church councils held. And these church councils usually gathered a bunch of bishops together. They would talk about the issues and then they would make their finding and excommunicate people or bring them back in. Um, Eusebius of Nicomedia holds his, own, holds his own. And no big surprise, he says that Arius is considered correct. And so what he does is he ordered the Church of Alexandria to take him back. Um, Eusebius of Caesarea and a few other bishops gathered in Palestine and Again, no big surprise, they sided with Arius. Now, this is about the time that Emperor Constantine gets involved with this. So he was fairly new to Christianity and he sort of expected, at least as far as we can tell, that all Christians got along and they were all um, in the same agreement. And he was constantly surprised when you've got these, these differing um, religious beliefs coming out and causing problems. So he writes to both Alexander and Arius, and he, he pretty much says, you should have kept this all to yourself. This is a very minor matter, and it's not worth arguing about. Um, Alec, um, Constantine asks a bishop called Osseus, who was the bishop of Cordova in Spain, um, to hold a church council. And he did, and this is in early 325 in the city of Antioch. And what they found is that Arius was guilty of being wrong. So these were condemned. Now you've got these, these bishops, Eusebius of Caesarea, Paulinus, and Petrophilus, um, were all temporarily excommunicated, meaning they were kicked out of the church temporarily and they were allowed to recant and to think about what they were doing. Then you have um, another church council called by Constantine in 325 in a city called Nicaea, and I'll show you a map here in just a second, to fix these problems. Now, this is considered to be one of uh, the most important church councils ever held. It was held in 325. It was called ecumenical. And what that means is that um, all the bishops from all over the Roman Empire were and outside the Roman Empire were invited to come to um, Nicaea and to discuss this and to fix this problem. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Here's a map here showing um, the modern day um, Ismet. And so Constantinople is here. It's now named Istanbul, but that was Constantinople. So they're fairly close. <coughs> the major players in the, uh, the Council of Nicaea were, of course, Emperor Constantine, who called um, for this meeting. You've got Hosius of Cordoba, and you can see here I've spelled it a little bit differently. His name is spelled differently depending on who you talk to. Um, he was sort of running things. You've got Athanasius. Now, he was not a bishop during this period. He was a deacon. And this is the Alexander who was having all the trouble with Arius. And of course, Arius was there. He was a priest, so he didn't have too much to say at this because this is mostly led by bishops. You have Eusebius of Caesarea, the very famous, uh, famous church historian. And then you've got Eusebius of Nicomedia and lots of other bishops. We don't know exactly how many were there. It's thought to be about 300. Um, Constantine paid for all of these bishops and their whole retinue to come uh, to this. Constantine sat them down and said this um, crisis was actually worse than real warfare. And you can read about this in Eusebius of um, Caesarea's Life of Constantine. Um, Eusebius of Caesarea tried to sort of redeem himself. And what he ended up doing was uh, making a statement of faith. And I'll show you that statement of faith in just a second. Now, what he wrote um, wasn't in total agreement with the rest of the bishops, so it was rewritten. And here's where you get this word I was talking about before, homo usius, and I've broke it, broken it down here. Homo means same, and usius, these are both Greek words, means nature, so the same nature. So God and Christ are the same nature. And here is the very famous Creed of Nicaea. And what I'd like you to do is to stop the video and to uh, read through this. Okay, and what you can see is that um, this is really a, a statement of faith. And this um, statement of faith you can still read in some modern uh, churches today. So a lot of Christians still believe this. So we believe in one God, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, we also believe in Christ, uh, begotten of the Father, uh, only begotten, and that is of the same substance. Um, he's one substance, and this is the word homoousius, of the same, the same nature. Um, when you get down here, you can see it. they do mention the Holy Spirit, but it's very brief. It's because Christians during this period weren't really discussing what the Holy Spirit was. That, that happens a bit later. And then you find 
sort of these things called anathemas um, or curses or um, what they don't want to believe. So what they're saying here is, um, uh, and those who say there was a, a time when he was not, which is an Arian statement, uh, before he was begotten, he was not, again, Arian and so on. All of these anathemas are cursing the Arian form of you. So what you get is the Creed of Nicaea um, coming out and it puts forth what we can now call the Catholic faith, that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are all one, all of the same nature, created at the same time or in existence at the same time. Um, most of the bishops, no big surprise, accepted this. However, we do have a few, and I've listed some of the names here, rejected it, and of course, Arius rejected it as well. Um, they primarily objected it because they didn't like this particular word, homoousius, of the same nature, because they didn't think that it fully explained the differences or how the son was related to the father. And again, this is Christology. Uh, you do find, surprisingly enough, Eusebius of Nicomedia accepting the creed, but he didn't accept the condemnation at the end. So what you see is at the end of the council, there were a number of people who were exiled. So Arius in particular was exiled and they were exi exiled to the northern part of the Roman Empire. And they were told that they could not enter Egypt. Um, one thing that also came out of the Council of Nicaea were a list of canons or laws. And I'm not going to list all of you, all of these. I will put a link up on our site giving you uh, access to all of these canons. Um, you would think that these canons would be about Arius, um, since that's primarily what the council was for, but it wasn't. So the bishops got together and, and formed a whole bunch of, or wrote down a whole bunch of laws. Um, why don't you stop the video and read through this and see if you can remember who this is really talking about. Okay, so what is really odd, considering this is Canon 1, the very first canon, the very first law that comes out of the Council of Nicaea, is about castration. So if there's anyone who's been castrated by barbarians, um, who is clergy, he should remain in the clergy. But if anyone castrates himself, um, then he should not be promoted. Now, if you remember, we talked about Origen uh, back in the third century, who castrated himself um, and believed that this was part of the New Testament. So apparently this whole idea of castration was very popular and the very first law or very first canon of the Council of Nicaea was trying to reduce the, the popularity of that particular act. Um, again, I'm not listing all the canons, but here's another one. Um, stop the video and just read through this. Okay, and what you can see here is Canon 4 is talking about um, uh, where bishops are coming from. So what this is really saying is that bishops who are going to be um, moved up to the office of bishop need to be from their area. So they can't, what they're saying is you can't be a bishop in Palestine or a priest in Palestine and then move to Egypt and become a bishop there, unless there are issues. And it does give the if um, down at the bottom. Um, so this can happen, but it's, it's frowned upon. Um, this is a, an outcome of a lot of what was happening in the whole Aryan movement, especially with Eusebius, um, the Bishop of Nicomedia. He was a bishop in uh, Pal the Palestinian area and then became Bishop of Nicomedia, even though he hadn't uh, lived there. So it was causing some issues. Now, after the council was over, Constantine sent letters to all the bishops telling them what the new uh, Christian faith was. Um, three months later, Eusebius of Nicomedia and one of his friends, Theogenes, were sent into exile. And this is primarily because they did not accept the anathemas at the end of uh, the creed. Now, what you find here is, and, and it's, um, I wish I could get into all the detail, but you see a number of these people who are exiled writing letters to Constantine and saying, I'm really sorry. Um, I didn't actually um, believe what I, what I said I did. And Constantine would recall them. And Arius was one person who wrote a letter to Constantine and Constantine recalled him. And you also have various church councils. So in 327, um, Eusebius of Nicomedia and his friend Theogenes, they were also recalled. So what had happened in the meantime is that uh, bishops were put in their place these bishops were then kicked out and Eusebius of Nicomedia and Theogenes of Nicaea were put back into their um, sees. Now, Eusebius of Nicomedia continued his arguments with Athanasius, who originally was a deacon and didn't like Arius and now became 
the Bishop of Alexandria. So Eusebius and Nicomedia did not like that. Um, after Arius recanted, or did whatever he did to get Constantine to take him back, Constantine wrote to Athanasius and said, he must take Arius back as a priest, and Athanasius refused. And this caused lots of problems for Athanasius. Um, and we've mentioned this um, before. So Athanasius was called to a council in 335. Um, they were there to consecrate a new church, but what they decided to do was to talk about Athanasius. Um, he was told to attend. Um, as far as we can tell, he got close to where the council was holding, but heard what was happening and then turned around. So in that same year, he was sent into exile. And Athanasius, throughout his uh, 30 years of being bishop, 30 some years of being bishop of Alexandria, he spent quite a bit of of his time out in exile, primarily because he's arguing with the emperors. Um, Arius was recalled to Constantinople, and um, unfortunately, there, Alexander was a very popular name. This is another Alexander who was the bishop of Constantinople. Constantine told him to accept Arius, but Alexander said, unless God personally tells him to take Arius back, he wasn't going to. Okay, and what you have in this um, slide is the story of what happened to Arius just on the eve of him being accepted back into the church. So why don't you take a minute, um, turn off the video, and read through what Socrates has to tell us. Okay, so what you're reading here is that Arius, um, on the eve of being accepted back into the church, uh, makes a run for the bathroom, and what happens is that he has a massive hemorrhage and dies on the toilet. That's essentially what Socrates is telling us. Um, we don't know if this is exactly what happened. It sounds a, a bit like propaganda. Um, Socrates also tells us that for years after, people didn't want to sit on that particular toilet because they they considered it to be cursed. But um, lots of Catholic Christians saw this as a sign that God was uh, not on the side of Arius and um, killed him off. So this is not the end of the story of Arianism. Arianism consider, uh, continues through a good part of the 300s. Um, and I, remember I told you that um, Arius and Eusebius and Nicomedia were sent into exile. They were sent into exile in the northern borders of the Roman Empire. And what happened is that they started telling their version of Christianity to some of the barbarians across um, the rivers that separated the Roman Empire from their territory. And Arianism becomes a very popular form of Christianity with these barbarians. Now, getting ahead of uh, where we're actually going to talk about in this class, but you've got these big barbarian invasions into the Roman Empire in the 400s. When those people came in, they were Christian, but they were Arian. So the story of Arianism continues long after our particular class.